Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the last few days, we have found out what's going to happen as regards Soyuz MS-22. If you remember, back in December, it sprung a leak in its cooling system, creating space snow and a spacecraft which didn't have a cooling system. And we found out that the plan now is that the crew will remain on the space station until Soyuz MS-23 flies up with no crew on board. Soyuz MS-22 will be It'll perform a return to Earth with cargo, but not with any humans on board. Now, in the meantime, that means that those three crew members do not have a working spaceship. And I want to return to almost 50 years ago, where we had three crew on orbit and they weren't sure whether they had a working spaceship. Skylab 3, with uh, Alan Bean as the commander, Owen Garriott as a science officer, and Jack Luzma as the pilot. Uh, on their launch, they had some minor problems with RCS Quad B failing during flight, but the spacecraft has multiple redundant RCS thrusters and they were able to fly and dock to the space station and begin their work. Well, they could begin their work as soon as they got over space sickness and they had a serious bout of it. A few days later, they wake up and there is a snowstorm outside of Skylab. It turns out that the author, another one of the RCS quads, RCS quad D, has started leaking. And it looks like it's leaking the oxidizer nitrogen tetroxide. So they get very concerned by this because they've lost two of their four RCS thrusters and they need at least one, preferably two, to be able to get back to Earth. Now, they managed to shut the system down and stop the leak. They lose about 10% of the the uh, oxidize of the nitrogen tetroxide. The biggest concern is that having two RCS quads fail so quickly in succession suggests that there may be something wrong with the propellants. So NASA begins investigating whether the nitrogen tetroxide batch has some problem that's perhaps causing excessive outgassing or corrosion or something. Um, and they begin preparing for the possibility that all four RCS quads will become unavailable and they will need to send a rescue mission. So the idea of sending a rescue mission using a, an Apollo spacecraft actually predates the Skylab program. They had this idea quite early on. Some say it was actually inspired by a 1961 movie called Marooned, where a, a crew are stranded in orbit and need rescued. So this was more than just like a, a exercise on paper. This was something where they built the hardware for the, the crew couches and they actually trained a number of astronauts in being recovered from a capsule with not three, but five people on board. Now, Don Lind and Vance Brand were two of the astronauts assigned to work on the development of the rescue spacecraft. And Don Lind, in his oral history, tells a story of going out to the Gulf of Mexico with a crew of three other astronauts and they were training for recovery. And he specifically tells the other astronauts, by the way, if the spacecraft is floating upside down, it's a bad idea to unstrap your harnesses because you're going to fall straight forwards. And this other astronaut looked at him saying, how stupid do you think I am? Of course, 20 minutes later, when they were floating upside down, that astronaut unstrapped their harness and fell face first in comical style. Now, as it happens, the backup crew for Skylab 3 were Vance Brand, Don Lind, and William Lenoir. So they just basically got rid of William and Vance and Don were the ones who would actually have to fly a rescue mission. So for, for the Skylab rescue, they would have had a modified version of the command module. What they would do is take out a lot of the lockers at the back of the spacecraft and put in two crew couches right on the rear bulkhead. So there would be a total of five crew members with three in the normal seats at the front. Uh, it would launch with two crew members in the left seat and the right seat with the center seat uh, empty. The, on the bulkhead seats, those would be rotated 180 degrees, so you at least had a bit of headroom, assuming you didn't mind you know, staring at a, you know, someone else's feet right in front of your face. So, you know, the Apollo command modules or service modules had been slightly modified from the Apollo program to make them more appropriate for Skylab. First of all, they got rid of one of the fuel cells and replaced it with more batteries that could be charged from the station. The fuel cells could not be restarted once they were shut down on orbit. They needed ground service equipment to bring them to temperature and drive them up to power. So those would run for like 14 days and then shut down after the propellant was uh, depleted. 
the reagents would burn into water and the water would actually be stored in a larger tank on board the service module. Other changes was that they cut down the amount of propellant available to the service propulsion system. That's the big main engine because it was really only needed in the case of an abort late in the launch or and for re-entry. So re-entry was the main thing it was needed for, but there were abort contingencies which could require it. Instead, they took a bunch of, added a bunch of propellant for the reaction control thrusters, because those would actually be used. After docking, they could be used to reposition the space station and uh, potentially move the space station, uh, depending upon requirements for like synchronizing orbits for certain experiments. The spacecraft, they what they did was they were just going to take the next spacecraft that was in line to be launched and they started the conversion, stripping out the lockers, putting in the seats. And, you know, they got, they were basically going to move it to the vehicle assembly building. Meanwhile, while all this crazy activity was happening, uh, Don Lind and Vance Brand were in the simulator. They were training for this exercise. And the first thing they did was they went and verified that as a two person crew rather than three, they could successfully perform the launch, docking and recovery with, uh, you know, no problems, even with a number of, you know, technical wrenches you know, thrown into the works to make sure they could handle all these contingencies. After that, the spacecraft wasn't ready, so they began to investigate other things. And what they wanted to do was see, was it possible to fly the command module with these RCS quads out of action? So they began a program testing uh, procedures for only two RCS quads. They worked a little harder and they came up with a procedure for using just the one. And that's, if you think about it, that's kind of hard because you have to be able to back away from the station initially. And these quads are located on the side of the service module. So any thrust from these is going to cause a torque. Finally, they really started to get creative and they came up with ways of performing all the maneuvering for the command and service module using only the thrusters that were built into the command module itself. That is the section that would re-enter the atmosphere and it would have a limited thrust capability to rotate the spacecraft. And for that it has 12 rotation thrusters that are not designed to produce any linear thrust. They're not designed to produce translation but they are produ to produce rotation. So there's 12 of them because you've got three rotation axes and you need a pair of thrusters for yaw, pitch and roll each. And then you need to double those up so that you have uh, redundancy in each of these axes. And they're placed around the space capsule in pairs in various ways. And the way I understand that this is done is they somehow assign different redundant groups to each of the hand controllers. So there's two rotation controllers in the spacecraft. And then by yawing to the right, on the one controller and yawing to the left, these thruster pairs apply opposite each other. You don't rotate, but instead you produce an acceleration. And it's known that this was possible to deorbit the spacecraft. It's barely mentioned in the Apollo 9 uh, planning. It's called hybrid deorbit procedures. So yeah, they showed that it is actually possible to use this technique to reverse away from Skylab, maneuver the spacecraft, presumably drop the service module at some point and then use this to perform the deorbit burn. This was you know, clearly, this is a very cool concept. You've got to think these two guys have to work in concert and together. It's almost like you know that movie Pacific Rim where you had to have the two pilots working in perfect you know, synchronization. So anyway, after all this work, they basically concluded that, yeah, you know, even if there were, if they had all the thrusters failed, they would still be able to return. NASA also then found out that in their investigation, the propellant batches they had, that there was no problem and that the thruster quads had failed for two completely unrelated mean, uh, you know, reasons. And they said, let's assume that they can return normally. So the spacecraft that's sitting on the pad, it remains in its five seat configuration, but the preparation is now for Skylab 4 rather than Skylab Rescue, with the contingency that if it's necessary, they can still launch within 10 days to perform the rescue mission. So yeah, the crew of uh, Skylab 3, they eventually complete their mission and they uh, leave Skylab using, their, using just the two thruster quads. They don't need any real special procedures and they successfully perform their re-entry. And uh, Don Lind would later remark in an oral history that 
he managed to. He was so smart, him and、uh, Vance, that they successfully、uh, removed themselves from a space flight by <laughs> by demonstrating that it wasn't necessary. They were that smart, and you know that wasn't such a big deal for Vance Brand. He、uh, went on to fly with the Apollo Soyuz test project later. Uh, Don Lind, on the other hand, he had been recruited, you know, in the 1960s, and he was going to be on Apollo, and well, that never happened. And then he was going to be in Skylab, and that never happened. He eventually flew on a space shuttle flight in 1985, Space Lab Three. He was a physicist by training,、uh, and that would be 19 years between becoming an astronaut and actually getting to fly in space. Now again, to be clear, this wasn't some random thing that was thrown together at the last minute by heroics engineers. This was something that was planned well in advance, so well planned that I found a document from before any of the actual Skylab launches happened, which not only specifies which spacecraft and gives it estimates on the timing. It figures out exactly what the best cargo should be because there was a small space between the two astronauts and the bulkhead. For the important scientific experiments, and they figured out exactly what they wanted to maximize the science. They wanted the good shit, and what by that I mean, they literally included huge amounts of allocations for feces, urine, and vomit. Yes, they wanted to get all that biological data because this was supposed to be studying the effects of long-term weightlessness on the human body, and that was really what they were interested in.、Um, Also, would be like all the film from the cameras that would be a high priority, and then there was a bunch of other things that they specified. So this was all planned out ahead of time. Now, thinking about this, you have three seats: one at the front and two at the back. Which astronaut gets to sit up front? Well, obviously, the two that flew the thing up are going to fly back. They get the left and the right seat. Who gets the center seat,、uh, and who gets to ride in the back with the poop? Well, I mean, you know, for、uh, Skylab Three, you know, do you two,、uh, put Al Bean up the front? I mean, he's the commander, right? But then again,、uh, Owen Garriott—he was the person that had the middle seat on the way up, so therefore he would be most experienced for that seat. And then there's Jack Lisma, who was like actually a pilot, and therefore could hypothetically help. I think that Al would have just, you know, taken the, you know, called dibs on that front seat. But we'll never know. So now, returning to the present day and the situation with Soyuz MS-22, while they're waiting for MS-23 to come up and deliver them a working return vehicle with、uh, that good old air conditioning, the plan is, in the event of a time-sensitive emergency, that the two cosmonauts will still use MS-22 to return to Earth, whereas Frank Rubio, the NASA astronaut. Uh, apparently, they're taking the seat liner that he has used from Soyuz and placing it inside the Dragon. I'm not sure how they're going to secure this. That's what I've heard. But that would be five people in a crew Dragon, which would be something of a record for a capsule. And of course, since we're talking about history, I can't be the only person that's noticed that the crew of Soyuz MS-22 will be stuck on orbit with a crippled spacecraft during the 20th anniversary of. STS-107, which led to the Columbia disaster, its launch happened 20 years ago. Tomorrow, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.